What's up, everyone? Welcome to Dipped in Tone, episode 37, That's right? That's it, man. Wow. Look at us. It's just like last time. Just like <laughs> it looks the same. It sounds the same. My mic is different. Shout out to the Patreon chat who was uh, taking bets on what shirt and mic combination I would be using and what whether or not Zach would be wearing a hat or not. So Yeah, I'm not today. I fixed my. I got my hair cut uh, like a week or so ago, so I gotta, I gotta fix it. Oh, there it is in the chat. There it is, Zach. That's, no, that's it. That's, no, that's the not look. Me. Put that in the. Drop that right here in the video. That's it. Boink. There it is. Copyright Eddie. Mallet. Mallet look. <laughs> um. Cool. Yeah. So this is dipped in tone. Welcome everyone. We don't have like a tagline or anything as a podcast. Do we need that? I, you know, I get uh, suggestions. Either in the, the comment section, there'll be some, or uh, via email. Every now and again, people will say, you should have this. And it's like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we can We're, barely... 60 Cycle Hum has their big spiel that they do. You know, the guitar buying, selling, trading, playing, gu- guitaring, uh, setting up, breaking down podcast, or whatever they say. Ain't no time for a tagline. There we go. Hey, there it is. Wow. I, I, I will say, so uh, Jesse and I have been trying to entertain ourselves while we're building pedals in the garage without like usually i'm watching youtube videos and for two people to do that that's completely distracting yeah (laughs) so we've been listening to a lot of music and um today we were playing some podcasts and i will say i think ours just our recording quality is pretty pretty good pretty spot on you know yeah not bad milton's nailing it on the edge yeah shout out to milton at blue feather recording this episode is sponsored by Blue Feather Recording. If you need your podcast edited, your song mixed or mastered, you can hit up Blue Feather Recording. Link in the description. You have a good voice for that. That good, you know, uh, zero APR. Of- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man, I grew up in, in the... It, shout out to anyone in the Atlanta area that remembers the... Do you have Shane Company up in Nashville? Yes, yes. You've got a friend in the diamond business. Shane mm-hmm. Company with... Um, let me see if I can remember it. Okay. Uh, with locations in Gwinnett, Alpharetta, Marriott, Marietta, Kennesaw, and Morrow. Open weeknights till 8, Saturday and Sunday till 5. Shane Company. You've practiced this. <laughs> no, I listened to it. Like <laughs> for, my for first car, years. my first car that I drove for years and years didn't have like any kind of CD player or anything, it just had a tape deck. And I, so I just only listened to the radio. Oh, man. That's and, rough. And I would hear. Uh, oh my god, when Tom Shane would come on, it was the lame sapphires, <laughs> so radiant, so lovely. She'll buy buy this for you. Oh my god, it's so weird. But I'll tell you what, when I was shopping for uh Tilly's ring, when I first started shopping for an engagement ring, where's the first place I went, Zach? Shane Co. Shane Co. Oh, and man. they didn't have anything that I, I bought but no actually that's funny because you know it's it's mother's day weekend Mm -hmm. uh so by the time you hear this it's all already happened but for those listening in the discord call your mom yeah tell her tell her you love her um but morgan and i we're gonna go back to where we got her rings and maybe look at an upgrade which i'm at first i was like oh no that's fine and now i'm starting to go (sighs) (laughs) (laughs) because you know it that can be a bill Uh uh-huh uh-huh. But anyway, yeah. anyway. Hey, uh, this episode sponsored by Shane Company <laughs> with <laughs> locations in Alpharetta, Kennesaw, Gwinnett, Marietta, and Morrow. Um, yeah, so Tilly's birthday is on the 12th, and uh, we got married on her birthday. So it's the birth diversary. It's our fourth birth diversary. See, that's smart because then you can lump things to remember in Just one day. Just one day. All I got to do, one day. And, and, and you can kind of like... Otherwise, you'd have to double up on gifts if it was a week apart. Yep. Somebody just slap it all together. Yep. Well, she's getting a house this year for her birthday. We're like, we're our closing <laughs> date got moved literally to the twelfth. So, on her birthday, uh, my anniversary, we're supposed to be closing on our house, and it's like that's it. That's all the money I got. Yeah. So here you go. <laughs> have fun. Have fun. <laughs> Walking into an empty house because we have no furniture. Oh, <laughs> uh, how's your week? Been fine. You know, we're just cranking stuff out. I've been. Uh, uh, really been get, getting it back into Destiny, which is fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, you know, same old, same old. Nothing. Trying to think. 
I know that the Novo guys finally heard back from their contractor about, we were talking about this, about how much it was going to be to spec out the new space. Right. And it was one of those uh, unfold the bill and then go, huh, and then faint. <laughs> so uh, well, they're, they're trying to weigh their options for what we actually need and what we don't. But as it stands right now, as soon as they lock in that lease, basically, because only one side will have construction on it and then the back where the warehouse area is will have construction in it so there's a bunch of rooms that nobody will be like working in Mm -hmm. so for the meantime as soon as the lease gets locked in uh i'll move into there matthew said though um he told dennis that if something doesn't happen soon he's just gonna shove zach in in dennis's office so he was like (laughs) dennis you better get ready because i'm gonna put zach in here if something (laughs) that would be terrible uh, I think Dennis and I really have a lot of fun just talking about right. guitars and shapes. So yeah, no work would get it done. wouldn't. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's like you wouldn't get anything done. Neither one of you would get anything done. No, no. So because Dennis, Dennis is a talker, man. He likes to hang out and and he's a quiet guy. He's kind of a reserved guy, but like mm-hmm. when you know when you're around, he likes to hang out. Yeah, he's. It's funny because he is pretty shy. But he's so funny and smart, and mm-hmm. like he's 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 a great hang. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. How, how was your week? Um, it's it you know same old same. Just trying to get get through this house thing, and um, it's stressful and and ridiculous, and it's like it's basically I, I've had to accept and forgive myself for not being able to work because so much of my mental capacity right now has been dedicated towards that. So, um, if you've noticed. The number of videos that I've been making recently has dropped. It's because I just physically can't make anything right now because my brain is so absorbed with this other stuff. Um, but yeah. on a happy note, tomorrow, Saturday, is my first gig in over a year. Yes. it's I'm playing with Noah. We're doing a duo acoustic show. Um, opening for an artist named Larry Fleet just outside of Asheville, North Carolina. Right. And boy, I am so excited. Um, Noah came over this week. We rehearsed. It was the first rehearsal. Dude, like even that, like the first rehearsal I've had other than backstage live stuff, but that's that right. even that was like a different thing. Um, actual gig rehearsal that I've had in over a year, almost a year and a half, because the reality is really the last gigs I had were December of 2019. So right, yeah, it's uh, it's finally happening. But it's like I've got this one show, and then there's one show in the end of June, and then there's one show in July, and then there's one show in August. But hey, hey one I'll month. take it. I'll take it, man. They're they're coming back in, so there will be a backstage journal happening. Finally, oh, nice. yes, finally another vlog because I really miss making those videos. So um, yeah, it's gonna be a good time. Yeah, that's that's actually how I first kind of discovered your channel because I think I knew who you were before we met, but after we met, I was like, oh, I should, I'm really going to dive in, and then like that's how I feel like I got to know you, uh, besides actually getting to know you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a lot of people did, um, right. which is cool because that's that's what like when I started the YouTube channel, that's what I wanted to do yeah. um, was like share that stuff and i haven't been able to for the past year i've just been sitting in my basement making guitar videos which is fine which is cool, yeah but. do you like Asheville? i, I do like Asheville. Okay. do you not like Asheville? well <laughs> <laughs> nope you know i nope. went i went uh, this was i think it was like a a baby moon for morgan and i like before we had graham we went there and because everyone said oh you should go do this and that and you should go here and you should just just go like roam around the city and stuff and we went we were just like not into it like nothing really caught us we went to a bunch of restaurants that were high ranked you know had had great ratings and just like had terrible experiences Mm -hmm. and it was Mm -hmm. just we mainly just like sat around and watched hgtv because we haven't had cable for years and years and years and uh yeah, I just didn't have a great time. If you're not into 
Asheville is great for people that are into like outdoorsy stuff. Same thing with like Brevard. Like we were just in Brevard last oh. weekend. I love Brevard. And Tilly and I are, you know, we ride, ride bikes, we're big cyclists. And Brevard is like a destination for mountain biking. It's Pisgah National Forest is like some of the best mountain biking on the East Coast. And, and Asheville has some of the best like road cycling and paddling and everything. So I love Asheville because of that stuff. Because it's a cool town. It's a funky town. There's a music scene. There is some good food there. So you can go and hang out in a cool place and then go do all that other fun stuff that we like to do. But if you're not that person, Asheville's probably not your hang. No, no, I'm not. I'm not like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. mind. You know, I, I like going to um, the Smokies and stuff for just like, a, but not, not a long time. It's like yeah. a day or two. And then it's like, all right. No, I'm, I'm all about it, man. I, when we were in Brevard last weekend, I was kind of like, I could... I could live here. Brevard sounds like some weird department store from it's like a small <laughs> chain in a really small town. It's like, oh, we gotta go to Brevard's. We gotta go to Brevard's and get some get yeah. an igloo cooler. Oh you know. uh Keith needs a tux for his uh freshman homecoming dance. <laughs> yeah, we gotta yeah, go down yeah. to Brevard. Get him make sure you get him one he can grow into. Y'all have corsages. <laughs> <laughs> Get him a suit that's three sizes too big so he can grow into it. Yeah. Man. <laughs> when, when we got married, um, the they messed up my shirt for my tux. Like my tux, the jacket and the pants like fit great. Yep. But my shirt was like two sizes too big, but it was like day of the thing. Uh so I just put it on and tucked it all in. But there's photos and like my sleeves are like coming like way out <laughs> of my jacket. And when I took my jacket off, it was just like this huge shirt. I felt like Seinfeld or something. That's weird. awesome. It was Actually, so stupid. It, and it's just a close up on the Brevard thing. I we were walking around. We went to this bike shop, and right down the street from this bike shop, I just saw a sign. It was like Area Twenty Two Guitars. I was like, Oh, cool! A little guitar shop. I'll just wander in. Unbelievable guitar shop. If you're in oh, that yeah. area, dude. I walked in. The first thing I saw was like four Tom Anderson tellies on the wall. I was like, Oh, okay. It divided by 13, Matchless, Port City. Um, yeah, the the dude there, Eddie, who runs it. We talk, I talked to him for like 30 minutes. Really, really nice shop. Really great stuff. So, yeah, uh -huh. if you're in the Brevard, North Carolina area, check out Area 22 Guitars. Their, their logo is like... Yeah, you know, it looks like an alien. Because like <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the first thing I thought was like, oh, like Area 50, like half of Area 51. Yeah, half of Area 51. Yeah, yeah that it was cool though. It was a really cool shop. So, anyways, nice. Yeah, uh, you want to dip a rig here? Oh, we should shout out Patreon chat if you want to join in while we're recording live. There's a new thing we might try today. Discord made an update. Uh huh. Where they're, I guess, trying to rip off Clubhouse. So we are gonna try like a post episode discussion hang for a little bit, where people can like join up and talk. It's not going to be on YouTube. We're not going to have a 60 cycle hum situation where we just kind of let anybody on because <laughs> God knows what's going to happen, but uh, around yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to join our Patreon and hang out with us while we're recording the show and, and possibly after the show link is in the uh, description. Okay. Going to drop these into discord. That took forever, but our shit are cheeky and fun. There we go. There we go. That's it, everyone. Look, that's a rare edit point for us. We uh, generally make it through this the show without any edits, but we had some technical difficulties, and we talked about Super Troopers for about five minutes. So, oh, they're gonna now be we're back. So sad they missed it. Yeah. <laughs> Swear to God, I'm gonna pistol whip the next man that says shenanigans. <laughs> All right, this is cool. I like this. What do yeah. we got here? So this is from Daniel Marshall, someone with a first and last name I can pronounce. I've been struggling with these for the past <laughs> couple weeks, uh, and he's got. That's a very high def picture. Oh man, yeah, the picture sizes were were big, and it was giving me trouble. Um, so, a Fender Professional Tele and a Reverend Double Agent OG. Nice, because there is a difference. A Tone Master, a Blues Junior V4, which in the photo, the Blues Junior looks like a hot rod. It looks huge because of yeah. the perspective. Right. Uh, and his pedal board is is pretty conservative, but it's 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 doing the thing. <laughs> There's a misspelling in the email, so I'm going to pronounce it as it's written. Palali Tune 3. 
<laughs> he's got a quartermaster from uh, Daniel Steinhardt, which is awesome. Nice. And in that, he's got a way huge conspiracy theory, which is a clone, green rhino, which is a modded tube screamer, a blue hippo, which is like a CE2 style analog chorus, an octopus, which is a DM2 style analog delay, a Strymon blue sky, and uh, he's running stereo out to both amps. And yeah, pedal power two, Ernie Ball patch cables, simple and sweet. I like it. So what do you think? Classic Palali tune. I feel like there's a missed opportunity with, instead of calling the pedal the conspiracy theory, you should have made a range of pedals called the conspiracy theory range, where every pedal, you'd have the flat earth drive. You'd have (laughs) the 911 was an inside job uh, chorus. You know, just start listing off your ridiculous conspiracy theories as as pedals. I feel like it'd be good. Because yeah. you could hit both markets. You could hit people who think conspiracy theories are ridiculous, like myself, uh, who think it's ironic and funny. And then you could hit like actual conspiracy theorists thinking like, man, I'm going to spread the word. That's right. On yeah. my gig. Everyone's going to see this. This is, this is basically like a bumper sticker on my truck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So guitars are cool, man. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Reverend. We don't. Yeah. We've seen a couple of Reverends on here too, but classic pickup combination Humbucker in the bridge, P90 in the neck. That is a P90, right? Not like a. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so okay, the, cool. yeah. the double agent has the P90 in the Humbucker, and then uh, you can't see the control plate. I think it's got, I think it has like a Tele style control plate uh, with the base contour knob. And yeah, I really like the double agent because the OG looks more like. Um, it's a body shape that they've been making for a while. Right. And um, I, I really like it. I think that's a CMA exclusive in this like kind of sh- pinkish hue. I was going to say, I really like the pink. I like that pink hue. It's a nice, it's kind of a shell pink. Yeah. Um, it's like a pastel sort of salmon pink kind of color. And then with the, the slightly, is that a mint guard on there? It looks off white. It looks it, but who knows? It might. Who knows? Could just be the color temperature. Yeah. In the... Send in your photo specs, by the way. I want to know what focal length and what aperture you're shooting at. I need to know your shutter speed and your white balance for all of these. Uh, and then the telly. Was Ameri- that was an American, American Pro? Profe- yeah, American Professional. Yeah, uh, I have an American Pro 2 Strat. And, and man, the Fender has done really well with those American Pro Series guitars. They're great. Um, yeah, I, I like... Um, I, I like every American. I mean, man, the, the the names of American fenders are so confusing now. I know, I know. Um, but the American pros are great. The only thing I, I I wish they would do on this color combination that would just be ridiculous, but because I'm a lunatic, because this guitar for those that are listening, it looks like a like a fifty two style yeah issue, but uh, it, I'm sure it has like a shiny black pit guard. Maybe yeah. not. But I like when they have like a bakelite. Yeah, bakelite. Yep, uh, I had the uh, 52 Hot Rod Tele with the mini humbucker in the neck, and that yeah. had the Bakelite guard on it, and it looked great. But that's the easiest. Just go buy a Bakelite guard and yeah. throw it on there. Easy. Yeah, if the, the only thing you'd have to change on a lot of those American fenders is the neck. And you can see the neck pickup has uh, adjustment screws in most yep. of those old school. They just mount to the body. So. Right, right. Nice. Pedal board? Pretty Pedal straight ahead? Cool, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, major love for the mini way huge stuff yeah uh, have you played have you played any of these i have not actually yeah. so uh i played the i've played the original aquapus well the reissue i've never played the the og aquapus uh i've always wanted to but now they're like insane right you know money so but green rhino's great it's a great tube screamer derivative. The conspiracy theory. I played one because um, it's a clone, right? And I mean, it, it was it was good, but it it didn't. W- w- I went to Carter and they said, "Hey, could you try some of these just to compare?" Because they had one of the Wildwoods uh, that someone had traded in, and then a few other things, and they were just like, "See, see if you agree with what we think." And I plugged them all up, and I was like, "No, this one doesn't do it for me." And but. I know, I know it's popular, so yeah. Um, not to to, to rain on anyone's parade. Did you hear that sound? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Listen, Morgan's got a friend and her daughter visiting, so yeah. That's we, funny. We might hear some squeals and yells. That's here. totally fine. Totally fine. <laughs> um, shout out to the Blue Sky. I really like that pedal a lot. I'm a Strymon fanboy through and through. Um, I, I just, yeah. Do you great. like the shimmery stuff? 
Uh, no, but I, okay. you know, that's because it's been, it was one of those effects that when it first came out, I remember hearing it and like needing it. It was like so cool in 2011 or yeah. whatever. And then I hadn't even tied space for a while and I bought the space based on the shimmer reverb. The space is a great reverb, by the way. I feel like it, it had its day and then it's gotten kind of looked over now. I, I kind of want another one because it was a really, really great pedal. But yeah, I just never found a situation where I was able to use it like without it sounding cliche and kind of weird. It's not, you can totally use shimmer reverb. Actually, the, um, the specular Tempest from GSI has my favorite shimmer reverb, which is like a really dark modulated it sounds like a shimmer reverb that went through a really bad four track cassette deck oh, okay and that's cool it's really really cool yeah i've you know i've never found a use for it because for me if i'm gonna use a reverb pedal i'm gonna use a flint yeah um but every time i've tried to use shimmer even you know on the, the hx stomp or when i borrowed strymons they just it's too worshipy. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, it is. But that's what I'm saying is like on its own, it is cliche, like worship bro kind of vibes. But sure. if you do something else to it, if you modulate it in another way, as you know, cause then you can, then you can get really creative and do some really cool stuff with it. Yeah. But yeah, just yeah on its own a use for it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about the amps? This is pretty straightforward. Man, I've got my Tone Master set up right here. I was playing it all week this week. Um, I, I love that amp. I really, really love that amp. I still stand by my statement. If I'm buying a deluxe reverb reissue today, I'm buying the Tone Master over the tube version. Nice. Yeah, and I, because they just they put that update out not too long ago. Right. And I need, I need to make a correction because I have said this before where I was like, oh, they should have put a USB outlet on it so you could update it not knowing that they actually did. <laughs> right. It's a micro USB and it's way up under the chassis. It's completely in the wrong position. But um, yeah, they put out an update a while ago where it was like essentially like clipping the bright cap yeah. on on a deluxe reverb and um, and they reworked the the actual reverb algorithm itself and it sounds fantastic. Cool. Yeah, I've, I've heard that it's, it's an improvement. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the Blues Junior? I know that you are more of a fan of that amp than I am. Well, that's a Blues Junior 4 that I've not played a 4. Mine is a 3. It's heavily modded. They're, I've heard good things about the 4. The, I think they, they kind of lowered the noise floor and they improved the taper and the volume pod. I don't think there's many other changes. Yeah. Um, it, I, it may have a different cabinet material. Yeah. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. The, the biggest problem with the three is that it sounds like it looks. It sounds like a small little box on stage. It sounds really boxy and kind of weird. And that's why you really need to mod it. But I've heard that the four, they kind of fixed that. Yeah. I, I really love my my Pro, ju uh, pro Junior. Yeah. Uh, four. I uh, don't like the speaker in it, but I think it sounds great. And, um, yeah, I think with mods they get better, but it's not it's not my favorite amp. But everything like the whole the the left from the guitars to the left, it's like that's perfect. I'd, <laughs> I I would need the stereoness. Uh, yeah, the stereoness is kind of redundant. I mean, it's cool for playing at home, but like we've talked about, I don't think it's really practical for um, you know, gigging for most gigging. Now, again, if you're if you're in a a first class like highest level touring situation, that's different. Yeah. You know, I know Pete Thorne has toured with wet, dry, wet rigs before and stereo rigs before. And that's great because he's touring with, you know, a consistent production team and a consistent sound team where they can take the time and they do take the time to get that stuff dialed in properly. But if you're right. gigging around like clubs and stuff, don't bring a stereo rig. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you, what would you rate this baby? <sighs> this is a solid rig, man. Really versatile, covers a lot of ground, really usable, good for home playing, good for gigging. I like the two different amps, again, not to use together. Uh, maybe in like a dual mono setup mm -hmm. if you wanted. Because again, the Blues Junior is not a Fender sound. It's an EL84-15. It's almost more like an AC-15 sometimes, like when you push it. Not totally, but 
it's not a Fender blackface kind of sound, really. Right. Oh, so he's actually in the chat, um, Daniel. And nice. he's saying he's typically, he typically uses just both amps for recording, contrasting the mids yep. with the Blues Junior and there the Tone you go. Master. But he mainly uses the Tone Master live. So Yeah, um, that's what like Bonamassa talks about with the mid stacking thing, like yeah. running multiple amps and having them kind of complement each other. Uh, I like it, man. This is a cool rig. I'm going to give this... The only thing I would like to see is maybe a little bit more variety on the pedal board. Um, sure. You know, just in terms of effects and maybe different options. So I'm going to give this 7.9 shoils. Cool. Yeah, I was thinking eight. So nice. Right, right. Hey, man. Uh. Look at us. Right in sync. Uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. So, yeah, there it is. So tell, here's our topic to tell, everyone who's been, uh, you know, if if you're watching this, we should have plugged this at the beginning, but in the chat or in the uh, the comments, some heroes each week will take and notate out our and timestamp our segments. Uh, so here we are getting onto our subject today. Are we in a pebble? Pe- oh God, are we in a pedal bubble? That's hard to say. Pedal bubble. So this came up. I watched uh, the pedal movie this week. Me and my dad actually watched it together. It was really cool. Uh-huh. He's he's an electrical engineer by schooling. Not a musician, doesn't play, but just he's been really interested in guitar and stuff ever since I got into it. So he knows about pedals, but it was yeah. cool to watch it with him because it really kind of put the history and sort of the importance of pedals into perspective for him, and it like really clicked. Um, you haven't watched it yet, have you? No. Are you going to watch it? No. I don't, I, don't, I don't intend on it. I mean, maybe when it's free, I might right. put it on in the background when I'm doing stuff. But no. And um, a couple of reasons. I live and breathe pedals every day. Most of the people that are in this movie, if I had a question about something, I would just call them and ask them about whatever it is I wanted to know. I don't feel like I have to sit and suffer through an entire movie to yeah. answer those questions. Uh, and I'm slightly butthurt that no one asked me to be involved in it. So, <laughs> yeah, I was a little surprised to see like no mythos anything in the in the in the movie. It did seem like at points they were sort of playing some favorites in terms of who they were highlighting and who they were talking about and who they were not talking about. Because um, mm-hmm. the first basically half of the movie, the movie's long. If you haven't seen it, it's like two and a half hours long. Um, and the first half is all about kind of like the history of pedals and the proliferation. It was awesome. It was really, really well done and in, in talking about like where they started and then the, the rise of the mass produced pedals and then the rise of the boutique movement. And then the second half, it gets a little convoluted because they start talking about the boutique market and then it just sort of loses its kind of timeline feel. And they're just like, and and this person's really cool, and here's their pedals, and this person's really cool, and here's their stuff, and here's their... St-. It was just kind of all over the place. But right. um, I was in it for about two seconds, which is cool. They did misspell my name, they did. which is... I, you know... That really makes me crazy, because I don't like when people misspell my name. My dad has misspelled my name before. <laughs> <laughs> Z-A-C-K. Wrong. Thanks, well, Dad. This wasn't like they, they didn't call me like Brett. It was Rhett <laughs> Shull with a C, S C H U L L, which yeah. people always do. It's always happened my entire life. Well, see, like, here's here's my thought behind that. They had to go. Did you send them your video or did they? No. Just, like, so I got an email about six months ago from one of the directors asking if they could use a clip from one of my videos. And I was like, oh, it's amazing. Yeah, man, would love to. So he emailed, he emailed Rhett at RhettShull.com. He went to. Rhett Scholl's YouTube channel. They had to go to my YouTube channel, like get the clip. I didn't send them anything. They went to the channel and then my name's right there. <laughs> right. And I, that runs all over me. I hate when I email someone and they email me back a response and they misspell my name. Um, yeah. It doesn't compute with me. And to me that it, you know, you, I mean, we, we all have those things like that one little thing that makes you go, no, i am never, even entertain this person again you know like i'm never even gonna think about doing that because they did this one minuscule thing but to me that's a pretty big deal that you missed that (laughs) it is and it isn't i don't want to sound ungrateful like i thought it was really cool that i was you know 
it was literally just a clip of two seconds from a video, but it was cool. Like they were talking about YouTube and like the impact of YouTube and everything. And it was like, RJ was in there for a second. I was in there for a second. Um, so it was cool. It is what yeah. it is. Um, it doesn't matter, but I thought the pedal movie was well done. It was entertaining and I would encourage people to watch it. If you're interested in pedals, it's cool. And yeah. you might learn something. You probably will learn something. Um, it was basically hosted by Josh Scott. <laughs> right. He's, he's like in it more than just about anybody else. But they they interviewed and they talked about and highlighted some some cool people. Um, and I th- I think they did a good job of getting credit to the people who deserve it in terms of the birth of pedals um, and the birth and proliferation of the boutique movement and highlighting the people that are like kind of the big movers and shakers today in in that world. So they had like, you know, Zachary Vex and Joel Cordy and, um, and Jamie from Earthquaker. And like, they had some, some, you know, cool, cool people in there talking about what they do. Um, but they brought up something in the movie that I thought was interesting, which is, are we in a pedal bubble? Because I mean, you can talk about this. The pedal world and the pedal market has exploded over the last couple of years. You know, yeah. is it going to stay like that? I mean, I think, well, I don't know. I mean, I want to say, I want to say yes. <laughs> I mean, hopefully, but with with the popularity of the guitar coming back on as strong as it did over the past year or so, I feel like it's going to maintain course. Yeah. Um, I do think we're going to see. We, I mean, we see trends ebb and flow all the time about everything. But I feel like pedals are here to stay. I, I don't know if, if because the the days of people just plugging right into their amp, I, I don't know if that'll ever come back. Um, yeah, know, you know. So where, like, what, what would we use in well, there's pedals? Uh, plugins, modelers, like that's the thing is we have things now that the younger generation of players that are coming up. Uh, so my 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 uh, assistant Chris is a perfect example. Chris is a great guitar player. He just graduated with a jazz guitar degree. I mean, he's a really really he's like a jazz head jazz guy. He's young. He's twenty two, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, we went to film a video at Rick's last week, and he was helping set up. And he set up the first pedal going in the front amp and plugged it in backwards. Right. And I didn't even catch it. I went to plug in. I was like, wait, we're not getting any signal. And it was plugged in backwards. And I was like, oh, he I mean, doesn't have any any pedals. He, he hasn't played any pedals. He hasn't done anything. Everything he's played has either been, because he's a jazz guy, like straight into a clean amp or a plug-in. Right. Thing. Well, but I was going to say, and then you smacked his hands and said, no. Uh <laughs> Go like, sit in the corner. Right. Ten minutes. Nose but, in the corner. I mean, using plugins and stuff for playing at home is great, but how long is that going to last? I mean, not every guitarist who's going to learn is going to, you know, haul their MacBook. To, you know, like how are they going to play a show? You know, because like not everyone is playing gigs where there is sound reinforcement to deal with that. You know, like your first band, if you're just a bedroom guitarist practicing in you know with whatever on your laptop and you're playing in your shitty band in some you know basement with no pa like how how are you gonna play you know i feel like amplifiers pedals are still gonna have they have to have some place but of the number of guitar players out there people that are buying guitars and actually playing them what percentage of those people are actually gigging it's got to be less than 10%. I mean, the, the the reality is there's millions and millions and millions of guitar players across the world that are interested in guitar that will never step on stage and will never get because that's not what they're into it for, right? Right. Um, so from that perspective, I can see a future where, and we're already starting to see it with things like the Boss Katana or the Helix or, you know, these, um, like the Neural DSP plugins, these things where... Um, in fact, I saw it on TikTok a couple weeks ago. I was my TikTok feed is now like all music stuff, and there was this this young girl who's playing a strat, and she sounded great. Like she was really playing, she was killing it, and I could tell she was playing DI, like it was a a computer she was playing into. And I cut, left a comment. I was like, 
she said something about playing in logic and i said oh cool what logic amps are you using what amps in logic because you know there's and she was like oh i didn't know there was amps in logic i'll have to check it out and i was like i could tell by her playing she's been playing for a long time like right. she knows what she she didn't just pick this up last week she's been playing for a long time but to her she just was plugging direct in and that's the guitar sound that she was looking for and that's happening with a lot of a lot of young players now they're not interested in like their dad's tube amps and stuff like that. They're just going DI and playing with computers, basically. Yeah, but I mean, even even then, you know, of of that percentage of people who gig, because you could say the same argument for people that are just bedroom guitarists and use amplifiers and actual pedals and stuff. Like, you know, this, this industry is not built upon people gigging. It's built no. upon the fans and the people who do it as a hobby and play in their spare room or their house or the right. basement. Um, but I, I feel like I don't I don't think any of this stuff will ever go away because despite the simplicity of it and the ease of getting into it now, because when you and I started plugging into a computer and playing a guitar through a computer was like I it, awful. It was too complicated and yeah. <laughs> Sounded bad. <laughs> Sounded it, bad. Yeah. Uh, but now it doesn't. No. Now now they these plugins they sound good. They really, really sound good. Um that, I don't think that's a debate anymore. And I think that debate of real amp versus plug-in, I think, I, does, it, does it matter? I mean, I just made a video last week about like real amp versus amp in a box pedal. And in the process of making that video, I was like, it all sounds good. Like all of it sounds good. Same thing with the Helix stuff or the Kemper stuff, whatever. It's like, yeah, it sounds good. Yeah. And, but and you can split hairs, but you know. I do think once people experience, because there's, there's a reason why loud amps and all this stuff is still so prevalent, is because it's a, it it hits you in a different way. It's a visceral, mm -hmm. emotional experience almost. And all these people who are playing, you know, the plugins and, and and whatnot, the moment they play a real loud amp, it's going to be it's going to change their perspective. And dare I say that the people who are used to playing with monitors and I mean, relatively quiet mm -hmm. um, compared to like plugging into a, you know, a, a half stack, uh, they may not be able to play as well if they play loud because it is, it's, it's disrobing. Yeah. Um, when you, when you actually play at, at a real volume. So, yeah. But I, I, I just don't think, I, I think it, you know, we're we're definitely seeing in the guitar community the digital guys and the modelers and and all this stuff finding a foothold. But I still think even with most of the guys who have adopted that, they probably still have a shelf full of pedals and 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 amps shoved in a corner, except for the beginners who might not have the money or or, or the space or whatever. So I think. And this is going to contradict what I was just saying, but I I said that for the sake of conversation as a devil, devil's advocate, I think pedals in the pedal world is only going to continue to grow for a few reasons. First of all, my generation, the millennial generation, and from, from what I understand about Gen Z, th there's a big sort of emphasis on like finding the handmade sort of small batch thing Thing. And that's not just in guitar stuff. That's just in things in in general. You know, yeah. you could call it hipster culture. You could call it whatever. But the spoke culture, the spoke kind of thing. But the thing about watching the pedal movie movie that really struck me when they were talking about the boutique era, you can get kind of lost in this when you're when you're talking about gear and this overdrive versus or this clon versus the, like these are all people. Like you're a perfect example. of This you're you're now two people in a garage making pedals by hand right yeah this is not but but what i mean is it's not some mass you're not buying a boss pedal no. it's not a mass produced you know made overseas kind of thing and i think that really connects with people when yeah. people learn about that and they start to understand that like oh man this earthquaker pedal was made by like a handful of people up in akron ohio or like you know this this um spaceman pedal was made in portland oregon by like these people that you know, there's a story. 
<laughs> there's a story behind it that's really, really cool. At least it connected with me when I was watching the movie. Um, and it helped me kind of look at the pedals that I have owned over the years and think like, yeah, like, oh man, yeah, Earthquaker. Man, I remember buying the Bit Commander. That was the first Earthquaker pedal I ever bought. And I bought it because it was wild sounding. Yeah. It was awesome. Went to the deep end of the pool. Yeah, that. it was awesome. Uh, they make one of my favorite fuzz pedals ever. The Hoof Reaper V2 is like, I love that pedal. And yeah. it, they make your favorite for now. Yeah, damn uh, right. We're about to make my favorite fuzz uh, pedal. Oh boy. Soil's fuzz. <laughs> um, we're not joking about that, by the way. No. It's in development. Anyways, so all that to say, like, yeah, I think, I think pedal culture and, and the culture of like, you know, the ability to kind of create your own sound based off of what you can buy and what you can put on a pedal board and your own imagination. Like I can combine these pedals and these effects and just about any way possible uh, to create new sounds. I think that's going to stick with people. Yeah. Well, in being able to tailor a pedal board to have something, like you said, that you have some sort of connection with the person that made it. And it's like this curated experience and it, and it's only gotten more and more, um, I mean, deep, uh, over the past oh, couple yeah. of years. And, and, and the, I think the thing, because I think you're right, I think pedals are here to stay. I think people's willingness to buy the same thing over and over again, made by different people is here to stay. Right. Um, and that's, I'm, I mean, I'm not saying that as a dig, I think it's like, uh, it, it, it's just what people do. I mean, I've bought so many overdrives that are essentially the same thing just because I'm curious. And I think that's what most of us are. Like these things are more accessible, even the uh, smaller company. Cause I, I don't even consider what most of the things I make boutique anymore. I think the, right. like the Olympus that feels boutique, the Wildwood feels boutique, but my normal stuff, it feels more just like a standard, thing even though it's just two people you know putting the final assembly and testing everything and boxing them up you know there's a lot of hands uh a hand work that it takes to make it a thing but it doesn't feel boutique uh the way that my early stuff did right um but it, there, it's just it's accessible for people to try all these things I, i'm curious to see where the where it's going to go and whether more people because i do think more people are starting to accept that um surface mount is not evil and we're definitely seeing a resurgence of the like really handmade point to point fuzzes and, and right. circuits at least i mean that's what that's what the algorithm is feeding me right so i'm seeing it and i and these guys are selling pedals and being successful so i know that there's a huge part of the community that's that's latching onto that but at the same time guys that make things like like me and like jhs and earthquaker uh, cause I feel like we're all kind of in a similar camp with our construction. Yeah. It, it's just getting easier for us to do it. And more brands are, are starting to do that. Um, I'm just curious to see how many brands kind of fizzle out and fade away and what new ones come in, because it's so hard to know who's going to hit or who's going to, you know, make one bad like Facebook post and get wiped <sighs> off the face well, of the earth, you know? But I was going to ask like, so there's there's two points to that. So first of all, I think as this community grows, which it has done really a, a lot, ever since even in the last three years since I've been doing YouTube, I've seen this community grow. Um, you start to get more broad and more focused at the same time. Like look at companies like Chase Bliss and Hologram, right? Hologram, I don't think would have been nearly as successful had they started in 2009. Because I don't think the community was ready for their approach to sound or like the Chase Bliss mood or a, a lot of the stuff that Joel does. I don't think that would have worked in 2008, 2009, right? But right. it works now. And and I think their stuff, their work is brilliant. And they're kind of taking things into a new space, which is like you utilizing the combination of analog circuitry and digital like DSP to do really, really cool stuff that you can't really do, you know, with a traditional pedal board. Uh, well, like, dude, not, that yeah. microcosm, that hologram microcosm, I, I am 
jonesing for one of those so bad. I don't know if you've seen that, but I'm stoked on that pedal. I think I think I saw one for sale for a good price locally. I'll I'll text you about it. Text me because I'm I'm seriously gonna buy it. Um Andrew Huang did a video on it last week and i was like oh my god and that's the other thing too is it's now not guitar pedals and they talked about this in the pedal movie but now guitar pedals are not just used by guitar players they're starting to spread to other parts of the music world where drummers are using in fact a good drummer my terrence clark was texting me a couple weeks ago he's trying to build a pedal board to run his drums through for sessions and stuff it's crazy and i recommended like he wants to modulate and do tape stuff and i was like dude get a strymon deco get a, a color box like I, I got some some stuff recommended for it. keys players synth players vocalists producers like people are starting to understand that oh i can use these pedals to do things other than like make you know a martial sound for yeah. example or whatever well, um but the other thing i was gonna say was like who really has faded away like in terms of pedal brands i I don't know of anybody off the top of my head that I can think of other than Full Tone because of the bad Facebook post. Well, I mean, even regardless of like cancel culture, um, things just fall out of favor. I mean, full. T- there was a time where you could not look at a pedal board and not see a full drive too. You know. Yeah. Like, and OCDs, but know, they were everywhere. I think there's a difference, and I don't want to get too deep into this because now we're going to get into a political thing. But there's a difference to cancel culture and consequence culture well yes yes, and to me i don't i don't see cancel culture is something that like oh i don't like you therefore i don't think you should have a career anymore where it's just a difference of opinion that's cancel culture and i don't i'm not into that at all yeah yeah consequence culture is something where it's like oh you said something or did something that's pretty vile and hurtful to people and you know so i'm gonna choose to not you know, do your thing anymore. And the full tone thing for me was a little bit more along the lines of the consequence culture, but yeah, oh, that's 100%. just me. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. You're right. Um, but you know, and, and maybe because I, I've, I've, I've talked about this to, to Morgan and, and to Jesse when we're working, it's like, we see the world through kind of a narrow lens, especially through social media. Um, yeah because we are fed what we like and it feeds us more of that. So, you know, if I don't like a pedal board that has this kind of stuff on it, maybe it's not going to show me more of that kind of stuff. Right. So maybe I don't know that pedals that have faded from popularity, but there, you know, there are definitely moments where you see, oh, this is everywhere. It's right. inescapable. And then six months later, a year, it's like, no one's really talking about it because they had it, they tried it, they liked it, and then they moved on. And that's the thing that I think is hard. That's the hardest part. It's like finding some sort of staying power, yeah, um, and and really connecting with people. And I think that is that goes beyond the pedal itself. That is something like like what I've tried to do with live streams and and things, which has slowed down tr- tremendously because of the workload. But right, you have to what Josh has done. You know, people know Josh. They trust Josh. They like Josh, and they want to have his stuff on their their boards because they feel like they know them and and in a way they do. Yeah. So, well, I think that's something I saw a lot when I was in the church world, that was a part of church guitar culture. And maybe it still is. I don't know. I haven't been a part of that for a long time, but, um, there was, (laughs) yeah, living in (laughs) sin. Uh, there was this culture with other guitar player friends that I knew in that world where they were just constantly constantly swapping and it wasn't just pedals it was guitars like i would play with guys that literally every two weeks had a different boutique guitar and that were like oh dude this is it this is the thing this is like oh my god this is just uh it's this guy and he uses like he only uses handmade sandpaper to sand his neck (laughs) like that kind of stuff. And then two weeks later, they'd have something completely different. Like, yeah, it wasn't that good. I just didn't like it. And I got something else, you know. I think people are way more fickle with guitars. Um, Which I kind of get, I guess. Yeah, but they're but, so much more expensive. Like, it's easy to say, ah, 200 pedal, $200 pedal, I'll throw it on reverb, get 180 bucks, get 150 bucks, and then, you know, meh. but But, you know, fancy guitars, that's, that's not a... Unless you're buying and selling Novos for <laughs> crazy money, which right. people are doing... Uh, you can't you can't do that. It doesn't ebb and flow like that. But right, 
Right. I've said that too much. Ebb and flow. Ebb and flow. <laughs> I say shout out too much. It's okay. Shout out. Yeah, I do. It's I, I get I listen back to these episodes to like it's kind of like my version of watching the game film to try and figure out like right. how we can be better and how I can be better and everything. And you I just write down I Zach cringe. stop saying like <laughs> I I cringe every I just did it earlier. I said shout out to like oh god I said it I said it um, yeah. So I think I don't. Th- I think the pedal market will ebb and flow to use your term over time. Cause that's what yeah. markets do. But I don't think that we're in a bubble. I don't foresee a future in, in the next three to five years where all of a sudden the bubble bursts and nobody wants pedals anymore. And all of these expensive pedals, like you, you can't, you're selling them for pennies on the dollar. Cause nobody's interested. Nobody cares. Barring some kind of massive technological revolution in advance, where everyone wants this new thing. But even when that happens, that'll be the thing for a while. And then that pendulum will start to swing back and people will want to go back to the individual thing. But, you know, it's it's funny because I uh, I joined, there's a pedal builder discord, which I'm still, I'm so shit at discord. That's like, <laughs> doesn't, I... I try to use it, and I'll, I'll see a conversation happening. I'm like, oh, I could talk about this. And then, oh, that was three days ago. Um, yeah. But the, some of the guys on there are showing that they're buying parts, and they're buying thousands of transistors, um, yep. caps, and things, because the downside to all of this, all the success is that for the people are, who are unwilling to move to surface mount, and even surface mount stuff, there's a lot of semiconductor shortages and things right now. Um, those materials are often finite. And yeah. the especially the old school style guys, the guys who are building things with new old stock parts, uh, vintage transistors using you know the uh, paper and oil caps from back in the day that they have to measure each one, that's going to go away. And yeah. so... Um, I think that is that pendulum, like you said, is going to swing away from that just because it's going to fall out of a favor. And then when it wants to go back, those pedals are going to skyrocket, maybe, right. because you will literally not be able to build them anymore. Well, I think I think there's proof. We look at the Klon, like oh, look I at the Klon and what the Klon has done. And the anytime ones, I, I was looking today, the silver ones like mine, um. Most of them are like six grand on reverb, and people are paying those prices for that. Maybe I don't know. I don't know if but, they are or not. The price well, they're price. selling though. Like even okay, even if Let's they're selling eBay. for four look. grand, yeah. right? That's insane. But people want it. But you know why? Because it's finite, and yeah. that is that is human nature, and that will all. And you're totally right, man. When you can no longer get a germanium transistor fuzz new, well, you all this get- old stuff. This, even the old stuff, meaning the stuff like, you know, even the stuff that like Josh is making or you're making that has the real transistors in them, the real parts in them. And then people are going to start mining parts. They're going to start getting pedals and buying stuff that have, you know, <laughs> the parts in them and pulling them the out. good stuff out and putting them in new stuff. You're going to start to see this like Mad Max culture of like <laughs> ripping, gutting old pedals. Oh my gosh. The, I mean, there are companies making new germanium transistors. Like it's it's a it's there, but it's not as good. Not as good. Oh my god. No, it's not as good. Dude, it's the real it's the old stuff, dude. It's gotta have the old ones, man. It's not as good. I saw it on the gear page. It's not as good. (laughs) I uh no, they are as good. But um but uh I think I triggered something. I I don't know. There's a lot of things racing through my brain. I was just gonna say on eBay. Uh, a bunch of silver clones, thirty five hundred dollars all day long. Gold ones for four. There was one that sold. Uh, an offer was accepted uh, around fifty five hundred for a Ooh. for a gold one for a gold one. Um, and then Matt yeah, Bennett Tyler said, Larson bought his gold one for five, didn't he? Yeah, well, that's what he said. I mean, after yeah. I think he he might have bought it overseas and he might have had some uh, fees and stuff because the place that has the most of them, I think, is Japan. Uh, and and that's all minty fresh. Same thing with tape echoes. Like I, I've yeah. been jonesing for another tape echo. I want an RE two hundred one. They're all in Japan. Yeah, <laughs> they're all over well, there. Yeah, I mean Roland. That that kind of makes sense. Yeah, uh, it, it it does. But Japan's guitar culture, like they've had a crazy strong guitar culture for decades, and so oh. a lot of stuff, a lot of vintage stuff, is over in Japan. They oh. have a lot of it. 
man, when when I worked at Carter, yeah, uh, drink. There were a couple dudes that would drive over, or they would fly over every year, and they would rent a box truck, and they would drive around the country. It when it was not too hot, you know, mm -hmm. and they could do this. Drive around the country, going to every guitar store, buying all the cool, wacky, weird stuff. Every everything, and like, and not really haggling. They were just buying it. Yeah. And then they'd put it on a shipping container and send it back to Japan. And like, they're just buying that. They were buying that stuff up. And it was, they were, those guys were so cool. <laughs> yeah, dude. Same thing's happening in the car world right now because we have our, you know, 25 year import embargo is lifting on a lot of those early Jap early 90s, like Japanese JDM sports cars and stuff. Uh -huh. And so people are going over there and they're not just buying cars used cars they're buying engines and parts and wheels and on, i'm bringing it over and people here are paying big money and i'm starting to see around here because you can tell because they're all right hand drive and it's right. not just like skylines and and you know 240s you're seeing these goofy old like minivans and stuff oh. like like cool shit start to pop up around here from the early 90s like the jdm stuff like some guy driving a right hand drive japanese minivan around it's like, that's, that's kind of cool i was thinking atlanta is going to turn into like initial d and there's going to be a little, like, <laughs> toyota like drifting around the corner dude we do actually have a even up here where i live in the suburbs there's a street there's been a street racing problem and i can hear them because where we live is pretty close to like a four-lane highway and a couple nights a week, two, at 2 or 3 a.m., you start to hear monster just engines out here drag racing and stuff. I mean, it's right. yeah. Fast oh, and Furious, man. baby. Rest <laughs> in peace, Paul Walker. I live my life a quarter mile at a time. I've never seen any of those movies. You're not missing anything. Don't. So. Yeah. You don't worry about it. Well, any final thoughts? I, 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 I did think of this the other. It's uh, a nice yesterday. RX7 in the chat. Yeah, uh, because I, I said I was butthurt about not being in the pedal movie. Yeah, and it reminded me because now everyone's I say, "Have you seen the pedal movie?" <laughs> it reminded me of when the Pedal Crush book came out. Uh huh. And then everyone was saying, "Did you, did you read that book?" I'm like, no. Uh, and one of the reasons why, <laughs> and this is a funny story, is the guy. I think it was the Pedal Crush book who was putting it together or at least taking the photos for it. Cause I think that had a bunch of like little bios about builders in that book. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure. Mm -hmm. uh, wanted to do one on me and I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. I can meet you somewhere in town. We can take some photos, talk, you know, do an interview. And he's like, no, I don't want to come to your house. I was like, no, I, I live in an apartment. We just had a baby. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a private person and I don't know you. So yeah. I don't want you to come to my house. And he got like really kind of in my face and, and interested by that. And I was like, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I'd love to be a part of this, but I don't care how many credentials you have. Right. You can't come to my house. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's fair. Yeah. I don't know. It was you really know? strange. And so from that point on, I was like, I've never read that book. <laughs> oh, well, don't be butthurt about it. It's a good I'm, book. I have it. I'm so grumpy. I get so grumpy. Yeah. I'm just a grumpy old man. Do you hold a grudge? I feel like you hold a grudge. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I am one of those people that if you just like look at me the wrong way, like you go in the book and I just like for oh. life, unless, unless you apologized and you know, I don't forgive unless you apologize. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So, but, but I'm one of those people. And I think you know this about me. Like if I like you, then I'll go, I will go above and beyond out of my way. Even if we're just like acquaintances, if you're my close friend, I'll, I'll do anything in the world. I'll belly out of jail, whatever. But if you just kind of, irk me it's like you're like my mom done. my mom is like that too uh, oh okay. and it's it she has a long fuse and if you manage to burn through that fuse never never again yeah yeah i have a long fuse but it burns really quick so <laughs> <laughs> so you have a short fuse then <laughs> no no it's just like it takes a while you know like people with a short fuse they do one thing and you just explode but me I, you can see me getting redder and redder and redder and redder and then I right right so so yeah I think I, I don't think we're in a pedal bubble. I think we're in a pedal boom, and I think we've said this a thousand times before, and and I stand by it. We are in the golden age of guitar. Yeah. Maybe not in terms of pop culture and its relevance in pop culture, but in terms of being a guitar player and your access to things and what you can do with guitar. This is the golden age. This yeah. is it. Because you yeah. can do all the old stuff. You can go and you can get the things, and it's affordable, and you can make the sounds and and play like your heroes played but there's also a lot of people that are pushing the envelope 
and turning the instrument into something where it needs to go. It needs to go somewhere new and fresh and different. Uh, and there's a lot of people pushing it forward. And totally. I want to be a part of that. You want to be a part of that. And hey. um, <laughs> okay, well, I want to be a part of that. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I'm really happy about it, man. I'm really happy about being a guitar player and being a, a part of the guitar community right now in this time in history. I think it's yeah. really, really cool. It's really cool. So. And- and on that point, if you if there are things that are happening now in the guitar realm that you think are going to be the next clone, like get it, get them. And, yeah, and, and just like the Bitcoin man, hodl gang, you hold, know, hold on yeah. to that stuff, hodl. Hold. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a few things that I think might be, but those are things you can't, you you just you you can never know. Like yeah. people in the '90s who were buying clones, I talked to Tim Pierce about this, and he was like, I he's like, man, I had three of them, I didn't like them, I bought them when they were new. I got rid of them, you know. Had I known that they were going to do what they're going to do, I would have hold on, to, held on to one. Right. But you know, when they were buying them in the nice people didn't know it was just a pedal you could get. Well, I mean, know? like think about you could buy how many TS tens or TS eight oh eights or you know, uh, old uh, way huge pedals could you go and find at local shops? Yeah, if you had all those. I mean, it's just like it's just like everything, you know. Buy. I remember seeing. Gibson Juniors for no money or Melody Makers for no money. Yeah, but I, I think the thing these days that people are like willing to spend money on. I mean, I, I, when I was looking at eBay here, um, it was a KTR for like eight sold for like eight hundred bucks. My God, you know? Oh yeah. Oh okay. One, two, three. Yeah, like a bunch of them for over seven hundred dollars. There's no. I had one and it was not good. It well wouldn't I work. I think it's okay. I know, and I know that yours had the ribbon cable problem but it's like i i feel like if if everyone kind of chilled out and just hold on held on to that stuff one day we're, there's going to be a lot of maybe not so much the ktr but anything limited and small batch i feel like it's going to be worth some money you know i think money. i think divided by 13 amps will be highly sought after I, to me the criteria is this if it's been like a small operation one person making it and it's really good to the highest build quality and it doesn't sell out. It doesn't get big. You know, look at the early matchless stuff, the Samson era matchless stuff. Like people want them. I think whenever Fred decides to stop making amps, you know, it'll take a while because they're still not like, they're still kind of under the radar for a lot of people. The divided by 13, 13 stuff. Like, People know about them, but they don't really know about them. And it's not a lot of people's first choice for an amp because they don't know that they're amazing amps. Right. Um, and I think that's the secret. It's always just been Fred building them with a you know a help. He he usually just has one employee there in his small shop, you know. And uh, when he's done making amps, he'll be done making amps. Yeah. And that's that's the thing. So look for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Look for that like oh, it's just the one guy and he's just doing this thing and. You know, I think Analog Man is a good example of that. Yeah, you know? hey, Paul Cochran, Tim. Yeah, Paul Cochran. Like they, they haven't expanded. They haven't blown up. They haven't really gone beyond just what they are. And then, yeah. so I think they'll be sought after. Totally. Well, gotta- shall we shill? Yes, exactly. we shill. Yes, we shill. Hey, I owe hey, man. <laughs> it's God, man. Hell. Hey, hey, hey. Oh God, Do you sh- have one. No, <laughs> um, I do, and and I think actually uh, I do, I do too. Hold on. Okay, I'm gonna wait patiently here while he. Oh, I got it. Leans you wanna backwards. go first? Oh, okay. I want you to see mine because I, I don't know if I told you I did this. So we've all seen, we've all seen this guitar. Yep. Yeah. Oh, uh, did you mod it? I did mod it. Of course you did. <laughs> so I put in, and and I, I think people might go, "Hey, what?" I took out the Fralin. Okay, because uh, I changed the pots. Yep. Uh, because of course, they are, you can't well enough alone. No, no, no. Because they use 500k pots, and even though this was a really high output pickup, it just it was. Dennis likes really bright guitars. He has you know said that many times. Right. And I I don't really. Right. Um. So I changed them back to 250k, or changed them to 250k, and I wasn't crazy about the Fraylin, so I put in a Demarzio area hot tea yeah you which did the uh for those not familiar demarzio i think a lot of people sleep on demarzio they do they do demarzio makes amazing pickups and the area pickups are their 
stacked single coils because so of the places. price point people sleep on them yeah they're, they're they're really affordable yeah and people think well they can't be good if they're cheap but yeah. they're good they're really good they're great and they make a lot of uh, great stuff but the area are there like they're noiseless um single coils and the hot tea uh they describe it as a paf slash p90 in a telly format and dude this thing sounds awesome. It's got twang, but it, it punches a lot harder. It's actually yep. lower output than the Fralin was. Nice. Uh, this guitar weighs nothing. It's weird. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, but man, yeah, don't sleep on Demarzio. Check them out. Yeah, don't sleep on Demarzio. I had the first project guitar I ever had was that uh, Strat that I'm embarrassed of that will never see the light of day. But when <laughs> oh, I bought I it, see it. it, when I bought it, it was not working. It was like completely shot. And, um, and needed pickups, and the only thing I could afford were Demarzios. And I bought it was like the Demarzio, it was like whatever the Hendrix set was called. Um, oh, like the Area sixty eight or sixty. Yeah, something, something like, that, like yeah. that. And I should go pull them out of that Strat and go put them in something else because they're good, man. They're really good. Yeah. Um. So yeah, don't sleep on Demarzio. Yeah. There we go. All that, right. That could be their new tagline. Don't sleep on us. Don't sleep on Demarzio. Yeah. Sleep We're with not us, pillows. not honest. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, all right, here's my show of the week. Speaking of Chase Bliss and Zvex, oh, uh-huh. the Bliss Factory Fuzz. I bought this. This is one of the second runs. Um, I missed out on the first run because I forgot to look for them when they first went up. And um, I messaged Joel on Instagram after I missed the first run. I was like, "Do not let me miss. If you guys do a second run, like, do not let me miss it." Um. So as soon as they, they, I saw it on their Instagram as soon as they went up and I bought it. This is 1713. I don't know if that means anything. Really, really sick Buzz Factory collaboration with Chase Bliss. I've only kind of scratched the surface with this pedal. I might make a video about this pedal actually. Um, yeah. Cause it's really, really cool. And um, yeah, I, I really love it, man. I've, I'd wanted a Fuzz Factory for a long time mm. because. It's just a wild pedal, man. Like what it does, it's I, crazy. I, I didn't understand it till shout out. I'm wearing my shout out, e, shout out East Side Music <laughs> Supply Nashville, <laughs> my East Side shirt. Uh, Blair showed me how to work it. Yeah, uh, because like the, the whatever the the knob that just makes it sound stab no, stab. Yeah, the stab yeah. knob. He's like, oh no, you said it like this, and he taught he taught me how to use it, which I have forgotten. Yeah, but. I, I I finally understood it, and I'm like, oh no, this sounds sounds cool. Yeah, but, it's a really yeah. cool pedal. The fact that they took a fuzz face and did that with it is just ridiculous to me. Oh yeah, um, but yeah, it's cool, man. It's a really cool pedal. Um, they're limited runs, so they're probably crazy expensive. Are there people? There's probably some on some scalpers on Reverb now that are trying to flip these things. Um, I so I don't know. recommend trying to get one right now if they're crazy money. But um, I really like it. It's cool. Yeah, so, it's, uh, 600, 700, 800. Ooh, yeah. The, uh, 500. Yeah, this was 400. I paid 400 for this. Yeah. So there's some of those for like 460, 450. Yeah. That's more reasonable, I guess. Yeah. I mean, but, how much is a, f- <laughs> I mean, not to, not to shit on Chase Bliss, but how much is a Fuzz Factory? Yeah. I mean, so essentially bucks? what this is is a Fuzz Factory with some of Chase Bliss's functionality added to it and, and options right. added to it. So you have like the dip switches. Um, it's got an LFO uh, situation you can put on it. It's got this aux switch. It can be like a momentary thing or a latching thing, and it does different features. So yeah. it's just a different fuzz factory that'll do some wild shit. Yeah, yeah, it does all the all the shit. <laughs> four hundred seems high right now, though. It is a little high. I mean, that's what I paid for it because it's a you know limited run thing and i like chase bliss and i like zvex and i wanted it because i like fuzz pedals this will probably be one of those things though like we were talking about a minute ago this will be one of those things that people are looking for at some point in the future because they only did a limited run of them it's a collaboration between two companies it's a unique thing it's different um i'm gonna hold on to it i don't plan on ever selling it but right yeah hold it all <laughs> so there you go show of the week Yes. Bliss Factory. Bam. Look at that. Look at it. Well, there you go, everyone. That's Dipped in Tone, episode 37. We've Third. done it again. We've, we have we made it all the way through. Uh, for those that stayed listening this long, check us out on uh, Patreon. 
subscribe, like, rate us on Apple Podcasts and all the other things you can rate. But yep. yeah, appreciate you. It's been great. I like doing all those things at the end, which I yeah. know is probably completely useless. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, it's best to save it. There we go. Dipped in tone. Coffee, damn it. Best to save it. Yeah, yeah. See you guys. Bye-bye. Love y'all. See y'all. Bye-bye.